we are talking about digital security core concepts. So basically an introduction to security, some of the most important things that you need to know or will help you um, understand security. So start with some really basic stuff. So what's security? Security means different things to different people. So you know, if, if you ask someone what security means to them, so for a lot of people it's just like whether they feel safe or they feel confident that they're protected. Um, and you know, obviously protected it against some kind of outside threat. So computer security specifically is about whether you can depend on the software and hardware to behave the way that you expect that computer to behave, basically. So if it's not secure, the computer is probably not doing what you expect. If, if someone is making the computer do something that you don't expect it to do, that's an insecure system. Um, so basically when we're talking about computer security, we're talking about protecting computing systems. So that's like the hardware, the software, storage, the people involved, um, and all the information that's stored on them. So it's easy to get caught up in thinking of security, especially because we are doing a computer security thing and it's all about all these technologies and stuff. You can get really caught up in security being a technology, but it's more than that. It's, it's also a process. So it's not just um, like, oh, we are secure now, um, or it's not, it's not something you can buy. You can't go to the shop, buy something, and oh, we're now secure. You can go and buy some kind of like rack mounted firewall or intrusion detection system, stick it in a rack at what, you know, in, in your um, data center. You may have improved security, but in fact, if you just forget about that thing that you've just plugged in, probably it's not giving you that much more security than you had before if you're not like managing that security. Because security is a process. So in order to stay secure, we need to actually manage the security features and devices and processes and everything. So we need to basically continually engage in security. So we want to aim to be in a secure state. Um, but you need to basically maintain that to make sure that you are, as far as you can tell, in that secure state and not in a, an insecure state. Um, there's something known as the golden triangle, which is basically saying that security involves three things. is the people, um, so you know, are the people doing things that make sense for security? The process, so you know, do you have the procedures and things in place? to make sure that you are going to be, continue to be secure, and technology. So do we have all the right you know, things in place if we're using you know, various products? Uh, do they have security vulnerabilities in them? Uh, do, have they got all the latest security fixes applied? Do, are we you know, restricting access to different people's, you know, using technology to basically enforce security um, policies and things? So some terminology, um, an attacker is a generic term that means someone who is attacking a computer. Um, and if you want to be more specific, you can talk about black hat attackers is someone who is nefarious and evil, you know, if you <laughs> I'll try and avoid the word evil, a wrongdoer, a malicious entity, someone doing something that they're not supposed to do is like a black hat hacker. Um, a cracker is also another word for the same thing, but a, but a hacker or an attacker does not mean a good guy or a bad guy, it's a generic term. So you can have good guy hackers and good guy attackers and you know that's why we sometimes if you need to differentiate we'll say white hat hacker or, um, or is someone who's doing it for the right reason or with permission basically. So they're legally doing it. Um, so that'd be like pen testing then. Yes. Yeah. So if you are a pen tester, so you doing penetration testing, you're an ethical hacker, you've been hired by someone to do a security audit, then you might be doing all the same things that a, that a black hat hacker would do, except that you're not, well, you would have a limit in the things that you would do, but you use the same kinds of techniques and you report on them back to the organization and they can fix those problems, as opposed to a black hat ha hacker who will not obeying any rules and they don't have any permission to do what they're doing. So the word hacker is kind of the media's term for an attacker and it's kind of um, 
become general use, but for a long time it was like if you were in the know, you say an attacker, and if you um, if you say hacker, you seem like you know less about it. But that's becoming less true. Um, but attacker is kind of like the generic term. Um, one of the reasons when you do use the word hacker, just realize that it has multiple meanings. So I consider myself to be part of the Linux community. And when you go to a Linux conference and hear people talking about Linux development and stuff, they all refer to themselves as hackers and they've got, it's got nothing to do with computer security. They're just talking about like basically, you know, people who are doing programming or people who like to do technical things and figure out solutions to problems and stuff like that. So the word hacker um, is just, just so you know, it is overloaded, it has multiple meanings. So who are the people that are attacking systems and why are they doing it? So if we're trying to defend a system, who do we have to think about defending against? Well, a lot of people do it just because they can, <coughs> and it might, it's just like an intellectual exercise, I guess, or something they're interested in doing. Um, and I, that was really true back in you know, the 80s and 90s, or most attacks you know, seem to be motivated by just an exploration of what's possible. So it's like, ah, oh, what? You say I can't access that. How much do you want to bet? I reckon I can still get past those controls that you put in place. So it's like, I, basically, a lot of fun was had at other people's expenses would be one way of um, describing some people's motivations and what they would have thought about at that time. Um, but as time's gone on, obviously, now that we use computers for day-to-day -day life to do basically everything, to manage all of our information. There's so many ways that someone who is motivated can make money from it. So that a lot of attackers are now um, actually financially motivated. So the now we've got organized crime. So people that you know will steal credit card details and use an elaborate plan to try and get money out of that. So there'll be a whole bunch of people involved um, in order to try and get money off other people, basically. Um, another big one is corporate espionage. So if you've got a company who um, want to know information, they're competing in, in a marketplace against other companies, it would give them an advantage if they know about what the other companies are up to. So you have like competitive intelligence where one company is doing market research on another and there are some gray areas when we're talking about computer security, information gathering, and so a lot of the stuff that we teach you over the next couple of weeks, um, the kind of like the information gathering stuff, it's not illegal to do that usually, depending on the information that's there. Um, so, you know, companies will use those techniques against each other to find out about, um, you know, how are their competitors doing, what are the technologies that they're using, uh, and things like that. Um, and then there's obviously the clearly illegal stuff like economic espionage, so there might be intellectual property theft and things where some company will, you know, someone who works at some company, I should say, might pay off someone who works at another company to give them access to stuff which might give them an advantage within their company, which gives the company an advantage. Um, another big one is insider threats. So if you are an organization, you might have a whole bunch of people working in IT. A lot of those people will have access to stuff that is quite private or it's important for the business to work. Um, and it's very hard not to give people access to stuff and to let them do their jobs, especially if we're talking about IT um, infrastructure management. How can you be a system administrator and not have access to stuff? you need to have basically root or administrator access to the machines in order to do your job. Uh, and what that means is you could actually do a whole bunch of stuff with all that information that you've got access to. So one of the, one of the threats is that you have got disgruntled employees. So someone who works somewhere and is not, they're not really happy, they you know, could be a threat to your organization. Um, so hacktivists, are, um, it kind of seems to have been over the last decade a lot of uh, more activity in that area. Um, 
and it's essentially hacktivist. Does, it, does anyone here want to have a um, just tell me what a hacktivist is? Yeah. Cyber protester, almost. Yeah, cyber so, protester. Yeah, so obviously there's an organisation that's doing something unethical. 4chan users tend to go and attack them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> something but, along yes. those lines. Yeah. Can you name, so you mentioned 4chan, which is like a um, forum on the internet with um, <laughs> certain um, uh, <laughs> bent. Um, hey, can, you, can you name any like hacktivist groups? Anonymous, yeah. yeah. Anonymous, obviously, Lulzek. Lulzek, is it? Yep, yeah, Anonymous and Lulzek. So they're, um, they, you know, they've done a lot. They're, it feels like they've been in the news a bit less over the last year or so, but particularly, um, you know, the two years before that or so, there, there was a lot happening with um, with anonymous. Although there was something in the news this week where oh, that's all right. Um, anonymous have a new campaign. You know, they try and rally the troops to try and attack um, ISIS supporters, uh, which is the um, the terrorist group or the rebel fighters and can't even look at it. But well, I think it's pretty safe to say terrorist group in um uh God, where are they? Syria. Um Syria, thank you. Syria. And yeah, and, and Iraq. Um so so yeah, so there's there's that happening at the moment. And um so basically they um will attack computers in order to make some kind of political statement, try and for some cause, um, and willful disobedience or whatever to, to, to make some kind of claim. And um, yeah. Yeah, so they're like trying to say DDoSing is like a virtual city almost. So if you yeah. DDoS a website, it's, if you compare it to the physical world, it's like protesting outside of a shop. Yeah, so a distributed denial of service attack is where you basically inundate a server with stuff so that but usually one, a common way of doing that is you basically just flood a server with a request and it stops being able to respond. So you could, if you've got enough people doing that to PayPal or whatever, PayPal will stop responding to legitimate customers and they would make the argument that, that, that it's like the, the equivalent of you know, the Occupy Wall Street movement where you sit down and sort of disturb um, like it's yeah, a, a virtual sit-in. Um, so yeah, so that's that's the argument. Um, whether to, to regardless of, I mean, obviously it's it's not legal, but regardless of what your own philosophy is on that, if you are defending a system, that's one of the types of people that you will be defending against. A botnet operator is someone who basically controls thousands or maybe even millions of computers that have all been infected. So if I manage to um, infect your computers with um, some malware, y your computer may end up becoming like what's known as a zombie and under my, my control, say, uh, in which case I would be a botnet operator with all of your computers that I could control to do various things. There are various ways that botnet operators can make money. So for example, um, if I just use a keylogger and listen to everything that you're typing and wait for you to type a credit card number, then cha-ching, I've got a credit card, some credit card details. Um, or maybe I can just like, you know, intercept your requests <laughs> to PayPal and change, you know, what, what you're actually doing. I could access your funds that way. Um, I could mine Bitcoin from your computers. So um, the, um, does anyone here know what Bitcoin is? Yeah. Show sure of hands. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, it's a virtual currency. Um, it's awesome, but obviously it can be used for, um, you know, various purposes, including um, buying drugs. including buying drugs. Um, although that didn't work out too well for Silk Road, but um, yeah, well, it did for a while. Uh, so there's a um, there's a Reddit. Um, ask me anything, uh, where a um, a botnet operator answers questions from other people about you know what they do and how they can sleep at night. It's a really interesting read actually, so I do recommend that you just have a have a browse through it. 
Uh, but one nice quote. I do it mostly for fun. Beating the shady white hat, white white hats that sell their snake oil is the most fun part. Um, Government-sponsored attacks. This is a fun one. Um, so if you are if you are managing the security of an organization, say for example you work at Google, one of the people you need to defend against is a government that's trying to hack into your servers. Um, so there are lots of nations that have um, cyber warfare or cyber attack capabilities and that includes like China and the USA. So we talked a little bit about um, Stuxnet last week and um, so in that case allegedly uh, George Bush and Barack Obama basically directed those attacks um, against Iran so which in involved basically developing although I'm sure Barack Obama didn't write the code um, advanced malware so you know Stuxnet and Flame are two examples that were created in order to sabotage Iran's nuclear facilities Accidentally, it escaped into the wild, and then other researchers got, got a copy of it, and hence we know about it. Um, but you know, in an ideal world for them, we would never even heard of this stuff because it would have only been on their servers and not sort of just escaped out into the rest of the internet. Um, but also, lots of attacks originate from China, and you know, the US, the US have basically said that the China, China do cyber attacks against various um, military um, resources that they have. Um, it's all kind of, they're allegedly state sponsored, but it's, it's hard to tell whether an attack, because there's lots of attacks coming from China, are they just like groups within China or are they you know, centrally managed by the government? It's hard to tell, but um, most people would probably agree that they are probably state sponsored. Um, the NSA, we know a lot about now, thanks to certain revelations recently. Um, so the NSA hacked Google, Yahoo, and all sorts of other companies. Um, so one of the ways they did that is shown on this um, the, the classified slide on the um, bottom right-hand side of the screen there, where uh, there's a little smiley face from someone at the NSA that really enraged a lot of people that worked at Google. Because basically they were um, compromising <coughs> Google's servers and um, intercepting the, the links between their data centers so that they could get access to all the, the user information on Google. Um, and that's in addition to all the requests they put to Google to, to provide information about users. But they were also like hacking into their servers, you know, data centers and things. So um, Google were really, really up, upset when this became public for a few reasons. Um, but as a consequence, they, those companies are now working a lot harder to try and fix those problems to stop, you know, the NSA or other people from hacking into their, um, um, you know, data centers and servers. Uh, the NSA also have a group known as Tailored Access Operations (TAO), uh, and we know now that they have a whole, all sorts of um, advanced ways that they hack into computers. So they can um, attack using software known as Quantum, um, which is Basically, it's it's kind of it's an advanced attack software, kind of like Metasploit, basically, which you'll learn about later. Um, that can be used to attack computers, and they they also use a system called Fox Acid. Uh, and using these these things, they can basically intercept traffic um, from end users, just accessing regular things, and basically um, insert traffic and do attacks against end users and things. Um, but also, NSA allegedly. Um, uh, hack into a lot of innocent bystanders and use their computers to launch other attacks from. So there's there's all sorts of things coming from places that you might not expect attacks from, but that if you are trying to defend a system, things that you need to be aware of. And here's an interesting one where the NSA actually um, intercept network equipment that's being shipped to someone, basically unpackage it all, take the hardware out and insert software onto those devices before sending it on. So you say, for example, you buy some Cisco routers or something, um, and you receive it in the mail. The NSA may have also opened those boxes and <laughs> added a little bit of extra software on there just for you uh, if they're targeting you for surveillance. Um, so, you know, hopefully the government um, 
in an ideal world isn't someone that we need to worry too much about, but if we are trying to protect the computer system, again, someone you need to defend against. Um, advanced persistent threats is basically when you as a company are constantly under attack. There's someone who really wants in. As opposed to, in most cases on the internet when you're being attacked, it's just like an automated thing that's just scanning across the internet. So most worms, for example, is like malware that will just scan a bunch of IP addresses and try and hack in. And if it succeeds, fine. If not, it finds someone else it can hack into. So that's easier to defend against than an advanced persistent threat where you're just constantly being bombarded with attacks. So um, often if you are a government, you're more likely to be the, the um, subject of an attack from a APT um, or some kind of activist. So if you um, have upset the wrong people, then you might want to be particularly careful because you know there's more likely that someone's really going to target you. Um, so um, there's been a few recently that are codenamed things like APT1 and APT28, where they have these groups of attackers where some security researchers have tried to identify where they're from and what, what they're doing. And basically, the certain people have um, put forward the argument quite strongly that a lot of these advanced persistent threats are government actors. So there's one, that, uh, APT1 is allegedly China, um, and APT28 is allegedly Russia. Um, and they, they make these arguments by looking at what are the ways that they go about conducting themselves, what are the targets of the attack that are coming from these groups, and they can use that information to try and get a picture of who it likely is. So, weakest link. I brought props. So, this quote says, principle of easiest penetration is that an attacker must be expected to use any available means of penetration. Penetration may not necessarily be by the most obvious means, nor necessarily the one against which the most solid defense has been installed, and certainly doesn't have to be the way we want the attacker to behave. So, as a nice little example of this, say I've got this very tatty old bag <laughs> that I've brought along here, um, and I write myself a, a secret message on a piece of paper. Um, so I've got my pen here. I will lock it away inside this bag. And what I want you to think about is how could I get this um, secret document out and modify it. So say for example you work in an airport and you know that some luggage has some, something in it that you want access to. How could you go about getting access to this? So I'm locking this with a padlock. Okay, so that's a locked bag. Uh, I'll keep the key. This bag, um, I guess as a bit of a hint, some of the tools that I have with me at the moment, uh, I've got this lock fix set actually. Um, so there's that, might come in handy, I don't know. Um, I've got some scissors, and I've got this pen. Uh, what else have we got here? Coffee cup, probably not gonna help. Uh, so, I don't know, what do you think would be the a good way of getting at this piece of paper? Yes? The pen. How would it do that? Oh God, that's good. Yes, all right. So that is, that, that is actually, that, that is the correct answer. And what I was expecting you all to do, which is what usually happens, is like, oh, you could use the scissors to cut it open and then sew it back together or something, or you know, use a lock pick set. But yes, you're absolutely right. This pen is all I need to get into this bag. So, you know, as you basically just correctly asserted, I can just basically, yes, I can get back into this bag and get this paper out. I could modify it, put it back in. No one would be the wiser to lock it again. All I need to do is pull this closed over the open zip. And then, hey presto, no one would know that I got into this bag. Um, so yeah, very good, um, I'm impressed. So yes, it, so the, the point of that exercise is, to, is basically to um, point out that you know, the things that you think of first are like, yeah, 
uh, is not necessarily what an attacker will think of. And the weakest link in this security is basically the zip and not the canvas and not the padlock is probably the strongest point. If you're trying to attack the padlock, that's probably the worst thing you could do to get into this bag because you know, the padlock's not too bad. Uh, although when you get to uh, next year, if you're on the forensics and security degree, I'll teach you how to pick locks. Um, and then maybe you won't be as impressed with the security that locks provide, but it's definitely not the weakest link in that bag. Uh, so if you um, want to see that happen on YouTube, you can also watch that. So security goals. If we are an organization and we are trying to secure uh, our systems and, and data, the things that we'll think about um, is confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So that's like the three main goals of security that's usually used to describe security goals. So finding the right balance um, is important between these things. So confidentiality is about the secrecy and the privacy of your um, data. So making sure that only people that need access to something have access to it is what confidentiality is about. So if we've got like a need to know kind of situation where you, you, we just tell people that need to know something and we don't tell everyone something. Can anyone think of an example of an organization that might have confidentiality as the most important goal? NHS. NHS? Um, let me think. Could you justify that? Um, yes, confidentiality will be important. Is it the most important goal? Um, yeah, could be. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so healthcare records and things, confidentiality is very important. Um, yeah, okay, that's a good example because we really don't want people to know certain things about health conditions. But say, say there's like some politician um, who's got some kind of like health condition, you don't really want that uh, to be public knowledge, and they therefore, yeah, co confidentiality is important. Any other examples? Child protection department. Yeah, yeah, that's a good example. Yeah, good. Any any other? Any other? Sorry. Bank. Um, maybe not. So, the, uh, with the bank, um, we I don't want you to know how much money I've got in my bank. True, but it would be far worse if you could change how much money you've got in your bank account. So it's not the highest sort of. Goal. It's it's up there, but it's not it's not as important. Military is another example of where confidentiality is important um, because they've got a very strong emphasis on confidentiality. Um, integrity um, is a, is where the bank example works really well. So it's where the the most important thing is that the data is accurate um, and that hasn't been modified um, in an unauthorized way. And um, so the example would be a bank. Um, any other examples of integrity being important? Data center. Data center, yeah. Like orange is data center. Yeah. In fact, for most commercial companies, integrity would be the most important thing. So if you can get in and, and uh, change their database to have stuff that is not true, that's a bigger threat than you getting access to what's in that database in a lot of ways. Um, so integrity is very important to a lot of people. Availability is another one of these goals where we want to make sure services are actually usable and available to you know, whoever our customers or clients are. Uh, we want to be responding in a fast enough way to, to satisfy people and it's quite important that we mitigate denial of service attacks so people are actually trying to stop our services from working. So who's a, an organization who that might be one of the highest goals? GoDaddy. GoDaddy, yeah, so domain registrar. Um, yes, that's true. There have been attacks against GoDaddy um, and other registrars. They all fail though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, like, yeah, they all fail. Um, I think it was, let me get this right, Rapid7, who is the company that do um, Metasploit, their website got hacked. And the way that happened was someone faxed their domain registrar and asked to change the IP address on their <coughs> records. And they accepted that and changed the record to point out the attacker's server, basically. Um, 
So, so yeah, but, but yeah, any other companies that where availability might be one of the most important? Yeah. Uh, Cloudflare. Cloudflare. Yes. So Cloudflare's whole goal is to basically help companies remain available <coughs> when an attack happens. So if there's a distributed denial, denial of service attack, what Cloudflare do is they basically provide a cached version of that website and things that various other services to make sure web, websites don't go down. Another example of that would be any web service like Google, for example. So Google make their money by providing advertising, basically. Um, but if their web site went down, say Google went down, OK. Any of Google's services went down. Gmail went down for an hour. You hear about that on the news. If um, you know Google's search engine front page went down for an hour, that would be a newsworthy event, and it would annoy a lot of people. And to them, they might lose business because they would go, ah, this service is unreliable. If I want to search the internet, I want to be able to do it now. Therefore, maybe I'll start using something else, <laughs> like Bing. Um, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, hang on, let me think of a legitimate um, threat to Google. DuckDuckGo is a good one. So Google it if you don't, Google it if you don't know what that is. Um, uh, OK, so what are the things we need to care about? Cost. So um, security breaches can cost an organization um, either directly financially, so we've been hacked into, they change our bank account details, or well, that's just cost us money. Um, or indirectly, so things like our reputation can be damaged. So Sony Pictures, obviously the huge hack that happened um, just last mo two months ago but got revealed to have happened. Um, Financially, and working from memory, I think they said publicly it cost them $15 million, which is probably less than you would expect for something of that magnitude. But if you think about the reputation damage that's happened, pretty much the whole world knows about the fact that they've been hacked. How is that going to affect the way that people interact with them in the future? Um, and you know, customer relations and things, you know, if you were going to sign up to um, give them your credit card details, would you do that now after knowing what's just happened? Maybe, maybe not. Um, so just as some very random statistic, in the year 2011, uh, the average organization incurred $470,000 in losses from IT security attacks. And uh, it's a number, whether how reliable that is, uh, I wouldn't, you know, it's very hard to measure these things. But the point is, it costs money. It costs an organization money. And you do need to try and evaluate these things and try and be as accurate as possible if they're going to make decisions about how to spend money on security. So some more <laughs> terminology for you. A vulnerability is a weakness in the security of a system. And a threat is a circumstance as a potential to do harm. So in this amazing diagram that I drew, um, which it looks incredibly lifelike, if you can't tell, that's water behind a wall. Yeah? And there's a person there behind the other side of the wall. So the vulnerability is there could be a crack in the wall. And so the, the threat is that the water rises to the point where it, the wall collapses and kills the person, right? So that's the difference between the word vulnerability and threat. And some of the threats that we care about is like disclosure of information, so to do with the confidentiality. We've got modifications with integrity, snooping, so people listening in when they're not supposed to be, masquerading or spoofing is when someone pretends to be someone they're not, denial of service, again related to availability, and some other examples. We might have unauthorized people trying to access something. It might be a local person just walks into a building. Yeah, there's physical side of security as well, so they just dress up as a janitor, walk in, if no one questions that, they could just walk in and walk up to a computer. We might be a user that has access to a system. So you are employed to use these systems. Those people might misuse the permissions that they're given in order to do their job. They might try and get access to more stuff than they, than they really should have. There might be misbehaving programs. So if we've got some software bugs or design problems, and you know, maybe we've got malicious software that we've, that we've accidentally um, you know, sub, um, installed on our computer. Um, and these, for various reasons, a program can try and behave in a wrong way. And when that happens, they might try and access various resources. 
Um, so that's that's another threat that we have that we care about. And another one is if we accidentally configure our computers incorrectly, so we accidentally set the security policies and things on the computer incorrectly. Uh, and the big one being remote attackers. So someone outside of our organization on the internet manages to basically do something that we don't expect. They might find some kind of information that we didn't want to be publicly available. They might kind of look for some kind of access to our machines. They might intercept or modify our communications. They might pretend to be someone within the organization. They might basically um, exploit some software vulnerabilities. So there's like some servers running that have a security problem and someone outside of our organization takes control of that server. Happens very often. Um, they might try and trick someone within the organization. They might just call up and say, hey, I work down in the, um, marketing department, could you help me out? I can't remember the password to this server. I need to log in and my, my manager's, you know, really, you know, giving me a hard time about it. You know, that that is a big threat. So in order to do something about all these problems, we need a security policy. So that defines what we allow people to do within the organization. So it's a set of rules for a program or for people to follow um, and we need to design a policy that makes sense to protect against the threats that we face. And a security control is basically something that enforces a security policy or a security mechanism is maybe like an actual gate or an actual program that actually enforces these policies. So, you know, we need to, to actually have controls in place to prevent these things from happening. And some controls are things like, we've got passwords, we've got access controls, we've got firewalls, sandboxes, encryption, and procedures. So these are all things we can use. So within an organization, we, there will be a whole bunch of people working together on security to make that organization secure. So depending on the size of the organization, we might have people who are doing risk management, so deciding what to spend money on. We will have incident response teams that actually jump, leap into action when something happens. We have product security teams, so people that help with the programming to make sure they don't make mistakes. We've got security specialists. We've got actual um, tiger teams, so that's like pen testers. So your job is to basically hack into the computer to see if you can find any security faults. And we've got physical security teams. And all of these people that do security need to interact with everyone in the organization and make sure security is happening right. So if you guys are interested in security, those are all potential career options for you guys. So when you go out into indus industry, those are things that you guys might end up doing if you're interested in them. So you know, if we're worried about security, we also need to think about how do we prevent attacks from happening, detect they're happening, and then recover from them. Um, and even if you're not directly employed doing something specifically to do with security, if you're doing anything related to IT, security is going to be somehow involved. So if you're doing web or software development, a single mistake that you make can cause huge security problems, so you need to understand them. So if you are administering a system, obviously, big security impact. If you are an administrator of a network, again, security matters. And if you're working in management, it really helps for you to understand the kind of threats that you face. So here are some job titles that you guys might be interested in uh, at the end of your degree um, pursuing further. So one of the final thoughts to leave you guys with is that thinking like an attacker is an important skill. So security, this is a quote from Bruce Schneier, security requires a particular mindset. Security professionals, at least the good ones, see the world differently. They can't walk into a store without noticing how they might shoplift. They can't use a computer without wondering about the security vulnerabilities. They can't vote without trying to figure out how to vote twice. They just can't help it. So if that's you, then you might have a job in security, like a, a prosperous career in security. And if that's not you, well, we'll teach you how to think like a, an attacker by the time you finish your degree. It's, it's arguably easier to break into a system than to keep it secure, because it only takes one weakness to be able to break into a computer. So it's quite challenging, but it can be fun. So we've discussed some important concepts, including motivation for security, the kinds of people that attack systems. We've talked about common security threats and security goals. 
And hopefully that gives you a bit of an insight to the world of security and things to come. Thanks, guys.